right. Good morning, everyone. Hope everybody have a, a good day so far and have a good long weekend. And thank you for coming to this um, education chat, September already, September edition. We're going to talk about 2D and 3D drone collection, processing, and analysis with ArcGIS drone to map and site scan for ArcGIS. Many of you already asked about uh, this session um, about drone to map and also what the difference between drone to map and site scan and how you can use it for teaching or research. So with that, we bring um, our subject matter expert, uh, Jeremiah Johnson. Jeremiah is worked with our ESRI in, um, imagery and remote sensing team. And um, any of you from Texas, um, Texas A&M, uh, um, Jeremiah is a graduate from there. And also Jeremiah is located now at, at the Berkeley office. So uh, some of you probably in that location, you can probably ping him over there. <laughs> All right, without further ado, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing and take it over, um, hand it over to Jeremiah. All right, it's great to meet everybody. Um, we're gonna get going today. Um, I've heard a lot about this group and how awesome this group is. Um, and so I've been looking forward to presenting this to y'all. Um, we're gonna be talking about a couple of drone solutions that, that Esri has, um, drone to map and site scan. I'm going to give you maybe a little bit more information on, on site scan and its kind of core uh, pieces, some of the questions that we have typically about the differences between the two and how you can actually kind of work um, with them together. But first, I kind of want to start with some basics. So um, I think it is relatively understood that, you know, drones fill a pretty critical gap. Um, I'm used to referring drones and drone data collection as kind of this missing middle. Um, so a missing middle meaning we've had satellites for forever. We have uh, airplanes that collect data. We have uh, terrestrial data equipment, um, but drones kind of fill in this missing middle gap between aerial data capture and terrestrial data capture, where terrestrial might be um, relatively time consuming um, with uh, either laser scanners or total stations collecting data. Um, and then with aerial being um, relatively quick, um, it can be um, cost prohibitive in some circumstances. Um, so that's kind of where, where drones slide in. And when we talk about some of the data products that drones create, the majority of the data products that we use today are orthomosaics. And I kind of wanted to touch on this um, just for a moment. I want to describe the uh, types of orthomosaics that we create. The first is a DTM orthomosaic. So the DTM orthomosaic uses the barest DTM and the most nadir region of each image. However, um, non-terrain features will start to lean away from their actual position. So things on the ground uh, would be very accurate, but things that are not on the ground, like these buildings in this example, will lean away from, uh, from nadir. And so while this is um, a relatively, uh, I guess, um, quick and easy way to produce um, base map imagery. It's not always the best when used for the um, uh, higher feature, or I'm sorry, the um, elevated features like buildings, towers, and, and, and structures. However, if you're interested in more of an agricultural use case or maybe streets, roads, um, creating a DTM more than mosaic is by far the quickest way to generate base map imagery. A DSM orthomosaic essentially um, uh, it compensates for that. So it's going to use um, something similar to structure from motion to generate not only the, the terrain, but also the features like these buildings here. And when it generates those, those um, DSMs, we're able to correct the orthomosaic so that everything looks um, top down and um, you know more or less flat like we would expect them uh, to be seen. Sometimes people call these true orthos just because everything on the map is truly orthomosaic or, or I'm sorry, orthogonal. And some interesting um, things to note is that because the uh, because everything's corrected and everything's orthorectified, uh, everything is the appropriate size. So if you had 
uh, maybe for instance, a tennis court on top of a skyscraper. Then you have a similar tennis court at the bottom of the skyscraper. And a DSM orthomosaic, those tennis courts would be the exact same size. They would not be scaled differently just because the top of the building was uh, closer to the drone when it was captured. And then you have this combination, this dynamic DTM orthomosaic. This is something that drone to map can create where you're able to more or less select the most appropriate orthomosaic for the um, data that you're trying to create. So sometimes you want to see the facades of the building. Sometimes you can get information like building height um, just by using the, uh, the DTM orthomosaic. And so um, this might also be um, uh, known as a, um, a dynamic orthomosaic where you can kind of flip on and off between um, a true ortho and um, something that's a little bit offset like the DTM orthomosaic. When we're capturing data like this, um, you know, overlap and focal length are very important. When um, we're capturing information, we want each image to be as, um, you know, as as high enough overlap as as is practical. Obviously, ninety eight percent overlap is a bit much, um, but we want, the more overlap essentially we get. Not only is the data. Um, um, I guess it's a higher fidelity, but it's also can be higher accuracy. Okay. The one of the main reasons why we're talking about higher overlap now is that uh, a lot of the um, processes that we use to create these orthomosaics are structure for motion versus traditional uh, photogrammetry. So traditional photogrammetry, uh, we have uh, things like really high um, expensive and highly accurate IMUs and gyroscopes inside aircraft that automatically knows the camera orientation and, and angle and everything like that. In those instances, you don't need as much overlap because we already have essentially solved the camera orientations. When you're using something like a drone, um, you aren't going to be using the IMU as much. And so you solve the camera orientations essentially by backing into it, by taking a lot of these images, applying a algorithm called structure from motion, and then regenerating where those cameras must have been when they took the photo um, by using a photo sneer nearby it. So those, that's why for a lot of the drone data you'll see, you know, we like to talk about 80, 85% overlap, which is crazy in the, the manned um, data acquisition world. Something else I kind of want to mention here, just because I'm going to talk about it a little bit later, is that when you are capturing thermal data, um, so like uh, heat signatures, things like that, um, you do typically need a lot higher overlap in order to process that. Um, the reasons are um, a little bit more complex than what I want to get into right now, but when you're collecting data um, from something like a DJI XT sensor or an XT2 sensor, you will start to see 90 to 95 percent overlap as each picture um, takes its um, thermal radiometric data, and then we can process that into uh, thermal orthomosaics. So here are the two drone solutions that uh, we talk about the uh, mainly we have the ArcGIS drone to map, and then we have site scan for ArcGIS. I guess the most um, the most basic explanation or the difference between the two is the uh, drone to map application is desktop based, and the site scan application is cloud based. That's the primary differentiator. So uh, you would use drone to map in instances where um, you have zero internet connectivity. You'd use drone to map in instances where the data you're collecting cannot go into the cloud. Um, and you'd use drone to map if you are doing something um, in the field with a laptop. However, SiteScan, because it's in the cloud, is a lot more scalable. And the data is a lot more accessible to others just because the data uh, lives in the cloud. One of the other differences between the two is SiteScan is seen as an end-to-end -end solution. So SiteScan has the drone flight planning portion. It has pre-flight checklists as fleet management. So keeping track of what drones have flown where by what pilot. Um, and it's saving all of that information into the cloud along with the drone data. So we see SiteScan for ArcGIS being used by larger organizations, um, organizations where Maybe you have multiple pilots flying at the same time, and they're all uploading data into the cloud um, for processing. And because the data is in the cloud, as soon as that data is up there, it's immediately accessible by everybody. Um, there's no, uh, there's not this necessity to um, to publish the data or to upload 
um, upload the data. Um, Windows or Mac base. So the drone to map application is Windows only. Uh, the site scan for ArcGIS, because it's a cloud application, it can be accessed uh, anywhere, even your, your cell phone. All right. Map production from imagery. So in its most basic sense, um, you know, you, you collect data with a drone, you process it, and you get data outputs. Um, you know, drone to map is Esri's most mature product for drone to map process, or I'm sorry, for drone processing. Um, and drone map has been integrated within ArcGIS. So uh, when you process data with drone to map, um, you can open that project in ArcGIS Pro, for example, um, because they're, they're, they're interoperable. Um, the drone, uh, you know, how I was talking about how site scan kind of takes a few of the um, drone flight and drone um, planning steps. Drone to map is just at its basic core, it is a um, processing platform. So it's going to ingest images. You're going to tell it what settings or how high resolution the, the data should be. And you click process and it's going to process the data. The data will live on your desktop. So uh, like I said, you can open it in ArcGIS Pro, um, you know, as it natively opens in Pro. But if you wanted to publish it to Enterprise or ArcGIS Online, um, that will be something that you would have to do either from the drone to map um, user interface or ArcGIS Pro. It's not going to automatically publish um, up to the cloud. Drone to map can create um, 3D meshes and point clouds, and there are some differences in the um, in the engines here between the two. Um, but I guess in its most basic form, the drone to map um, application, because it is a single engine that lives on your computer, it's going to produce um, these data products, pretty um, standard, you know, standard meshes, standard point clouds, um, standard ortho mosaics. Um, we're going to talk about site scanning a little bit, but site scan kind of um, operates just a little bit differently here. So now let's talk about site scan. So in a very similar fashion, you site scan is a um, a processing platform that intakes drone imagery and processes them into the same ortho mosaics, point clouds, and digital elevation models. However, because site scan was developed as an end-to-end -end solution, there's a, an additional application called site scan flight for ArcGIS. And this is an iPad application that actually talks directly with the drone that's going to be capturing the data. So then this iPad application, this is where you know, your pre-flight checklist would be stored. Um, you can create flight plans, save flight plans in the cloud so that others um, can execute them. And you can refly flight plans that have been been flown in the past. So that's the iPad app. It connects to the drone. The drone goes out and flies the imagery where it is processed in, in site scan and generates these ortho mosaics, point clouds, 3D meshes, and elevation models. We kind of call these um, this this cloud portion of site scan site scan manager so if we talk about site scan flight that's the ipad app when we talk about site scan manager that is the web application but really the web application is essentially a front end um, to a lot of back end stuff that's more or less hidden to the user but site scan manager is where you would log into you know sitescan.arcgis.com where you would see all of the drone data once it's uploaded and processed you can collaborate on that data. There are certain bits of analysis tools that you can use within Manager, um, but it's all going to be within this web application. Uh, I see a couple of questions about Site Scan Flight and Android. Um, Site Scan Flight is going to be iPad only. Um, I believe there might be a iPhone app that comes out, um, but it's pretty heavily built on Apple's uh, ecosystem infrastructure, so it'll be iOS only. So site scan, like I said, it works in the cloud. So we have Amazon um, EC2 instances that are spun up in order to process the data. What this means is that if you have um, you know, a batch of photos, you know, 50, 500, um, 1,000 photos, you would upload them into the site scan cloud and we would instantiate a processing server um, for you. So that would process that batch of images, drop it into your site scan manager account, You'd get an email, and then um, 
uh, you'll be able to log into your site scene manager to view that data um, once it's been processed. Um, this is a differentiator from drone to map, which processes them sequentially. So if you have several flights, you would queue up the flights and they would process one after another. Um, with SightScan, obviously, because it's an Amazon, if you flew multiple flights, it would all process at the same time. There is a connector piece between SightScan Manager and ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, so where um, we're drone to map because it's desktop based, you you know you you run a essentially a geoprocessing tool in order to publish the data from drone to map to enterprise or online. Um, with site scan, it works a little bit differently because it's already in the cloud. You have a cloud connector and you essentially tell it, do I want to go to enterprise portal? Do I want to go to ArcGIS online? And then you authenticate appropriately. And then you tell it which folder, which groups you want to share to. And then it'll just take those, um, those raw data files, the LAS files for point clouds, the TIFF files for the ortho mosaics. And it will um, create hosted services and tile caches in your enterprise portal or ArcGIS online organization for you. For those that use um, Autodesk tools, um, know that you know Esri and Autodesk are alliance partners. And so the site scan data, the cloud integration also has an Autodesk BIM 360. I believe Autodesk is now calling this construction cloud. Um, and the, um, the construction cloud is where you can also publish data if you are uh, publishing um, drone data, process and site scan into something like Civil 3D, Navisworks, these are other like survey or construction or engineering applications that would also ingest this data. All right, so this is kind of the portion that is when we call site scan, this is kind of what we're talking about. It's the flight application. It is the manager application that includes the cloud. And so when you um, subscribe to SiteScan, you're subscribing to, to all of this. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how SiteScan is structured. Um, with drone to map it's, uh, I guess it's a much simpler application just because it is a, it's a named user license that gets installed onto a machine um, that processes data. Um, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, I wanted to kind of show how site scans authenticated and the different user types for, for site scan because I do get a lot of questions around this. So at the top level of site scan, we call this an organization. So um, uh, you would have an organization and then within this organization, you would have projects and each project you can kind of think of as a, a location where drone flights are, are taken. So. Uh, it might be a specific area of campus, it might be a research area, um, but this would be a, a, a location that you would you know, potentially be going back and flying. And the reason why we organized it like this is because things like ground control points, um, overlays like PDF overlays or shapefile overlays tend to be associated with a specific location, a project location. And that's where you would save all of this um, overlays or uh, um, other data that you would go back and use on subsequent flights. So that's uh, what the project is. And then you have missions. Missions you can kind of think of as a flight. Um, the reason why we call them missions is that because sometimes missions can be created from multiple flights. So one of the advantages of drones is that you can um, capture a single area in different ways, um, different types of flight patterns. And then you would merge those data um, products together into a mission to create a single a data set. So that's what a mission is. The licenses for this, we have two different types of licenses. We have an operator license and an access license. The reason why we split this up is because uh, we understand that not every site scan user is going to be a drone operator, is not going to be uploading photos to the cloud for processing. So we split this up. We have um, the operator license, which is your license to fly the drone, to upload um, drone data to manager for processing. And this um, operator license, you know, essentially comes with, um, with unlimited processing and unlimited storage for that subscription term. An access license would be for somebody who is not flying the drone out in the field, 
and does not need to upload data for processing. Um, but they are going to be using the data. They might be tagging ground control points, publishing data to ArcGIS online or enterprise, downloading the data for use in Pro. Um, this is a, a significantly cheaper license that essentially allows unlimited use of the cloud product. They just can't fly and upload more data uh, to be processed. All right, so something I want to um, kind of clarify here is that we talked about this site scan workflow, the site scan flight app that goes into the site scan manager that goes into ArcGIS Enterprise or uh, ArcGIS Online. But we do have the capability to use the site scan flight app combined with the other um, imagery products that we have, you know, we've been talking about drawn to map, but we also have ortho mapping and ortho maker, um, which I'm not going to cover today. Um, but know that the images from site scan flight can go directly into these other products for um, for processing into these these data products. There are two applications on the Apple App Store. Uh, there's site scan and site scan LE. Site scan LE does not require a site scan subscription at all to download and use. It's just completely disconnected from the cloud. So when you download it, it's just going to ask for your ArcGIS credentials, I believe. And then you're free to use the application for use for its drone to map, ortho mapping, ortho maker, you know, whatever you need. Um, this is important because some of the flight modes um, within the site scan are pretty unique in the drone industry. We have flight modes specifically for mapping facades of buildings. I'm going to go into it a little bit, but we're going to have different flight modes for mapping different things, uh, bridges, dams, facades of buildings, things like that. Um, that can be very useful even if you're not a subscriber to site scan. And we want to make sure that if you uh, want to use um, these flight modes, you can with your existing uh, drone workflows. Let me make sure that I'm covering the questions because I see the questions flowing in and I'm trying to answer them as we as we go. Um, somebody's asking if sites can be can be used to process flight data captured with another autonomous control software. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So the site scan processing platform accepts geotagged images. So if you're using a drone that's not supported by the flight app, um, like a sense like EB or something like uh, the Phantom 4 multispectral or something, um, you can take those images and you can upload them to uh, site scan and, and process them there in the cloud, uh, even if they're not supported by the flight planning application. Um, supporting non DJI drones. So we're currently working on that. Um, the, by far and away, the majority of the drones that are used by our customers are DJI drones. So those are the ones that are obviously prioritized, but there are some instances where um, you can't use a DJI drone. We're currently work at, working with as we partner Aturian to support Aturian powered drones. Um, we, uh, I see the pair Anafi in some of these. Um, the pair Anafi doesn't have the market share quite enough um, for, um, for site scan just yet. We're friends with Parrot, obviously. Um, and we've been talking to them about the pair Anafi AI, um, but we don't have enough demand in the market to put in the engineering work to, to support these, um, these other drones. Um, let's talk about terrain awareness. So site sand flight application, both uh, both of the applications, because it, um, they're essentially the same. It's just one is connected to the cloud and one is not connected to the cloud. And by cloud, I mean the site scan manager processing cloud. Um, but they do have terrain awareness. Um, so it's going to pull global terrain data from, uh, from the living atlas, essentially, and you'll be able to have terrain following flights. Um, and that's what we... That's what we use for any of our terrain following missions. Uh, Aturian, uh, <laughs> spelling Aturian. Actually, it might be easier for me to type it. Aturian, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> They're an Esri partner. Um, Skydio, we're currently talking to Skydio. Skydio is not interested in working with a flight planner. Um, they're currently developing a flight planner for their application, um, but we're working with Skydio as we have um, quite a few customers that are using Skydio drones for things like uh, bridge inspections. We found that they're not um, really the best for mapping. So like if you're mapping multiple acres, um, they're not really the best for, for that type of a workflow. 
but a lot of like inspection or uh, reconstruction, like building reconstruction, bridge reconstruction, they're very good at. And so we're working with them to make sure that the data collected by the Skydio drones is processed great with the site scan processing engine. All right, one more, and then I'm gonna move forward with the slides. The DJI Mavic Mini, uh, I'm answering this one because we get asked this a lot. Um, the Mavic Minis, the Mavic Airs, um, the Mavic S, anyway, those lower uh, cost Mavics, they actually don't have um, waypoint capability. So they, they don't have the capability for us to send a mission to, uh, to the drone. I think there are other flight apps like the Litchi flight app that can support it, but essentially what it does is it sends fake um, command, like drone stick commands to the drone um, instead of waypoints to help kind of work around that problem. But SightScan is a waypoint only uh, flight planning app. And so right now we don't support drones that don't support waypoints. Let's talk about the flight app just a little bit. Um, oh, I apologize here. I forgot about ArcGIS Quick Capture. So this is actually a really important integration um, that is really interesting, especially for this real-time um, workflow. Um, ArcGIS Quick Capture is a is a, a mobile app that can connect to remote GPS. So you know you can connect to a Bluetooth GPS, you can connect to a you know an uh, external GPS, but you can also connect it to your drone's GPS when you're running SightScan, the flight app, and ArcGIS Quick Capture uh, together. You can run them on the same device. I've done it before. Where I have them running both on my iPad. You can have them running on multiple devices, so two phones. Um, the documentation is um, on our um, on our documentation page, but essentially the way it works is the uh, iPad app sends out a GPS data stream over a local network that connects directly to a mobile device running ArcGIS Quick Capture. And what this means is that you can have a pilot flying the drone and looking, you know, through the uh, through the lens of the camera and having somebody on a mobile device with Quick Capture capturing points, lines, and polygons using the location of the drone as the input instead of the location of the map of the mobile device. One great example, which is used um, over here in California, is mapping um, wildfire boundaries. So being able to take off the drone and manually fly the drone across the wildfire boundary every morning as the wildfire moves, and having somebody with quick map essentially creating that polyline that gets created and, on, and instantaneously uploading to ArcGIS online for uh, analysis. Very powerful, very quick. Uh, we also have um, a forestry organization in Sweden that is using this to find and locate trees that have um, you know, bark beetle infestation or, or different things as they're trying to map. Instead of hiking around, they can use the drone to move around and then locate using the quick capture app. All right, full motion video and ArcGIS Pro. A lot of people are not familiar with full motion video. I really wanna to touch on it right here. So full motion video is essentially geospatially aware videos. Uh, it is a former uh, military capability. So having really expensive uh, gimbals on uh, drones or on aircraft that have laser pointers and high accuracy IMUs essentially so that wherever this camera is pointing, you can, geo, it, the camera is geospatially aware. So you can click on points in the video and have them located on a map or have the points or shapes on a map be located in the video. What we've done with the SightScan flight app is we've made this as easy as possible to turn drone imagery, commercial off the shelf, sell, commercial off the shelf drone video into geospatially aware full motion video. And essentially all this um, requires is a SightScan flight app either one, again, the standard one or the LE version. And you can fly a manual flight mode or an automated flight mode and, and there's a little checkbox that says take video. And when you take video, instead of taking photos, it'll take video and it'll start to log a CSV file of telemetry data onto the iPad that can be used after the flight inside of ArcGIS Pro using the multiplexer ge geoprocessing tool. And the two inputs for that geoprocessing tool is the raw drone video that came from the SD card of the camera, and then the CSV file that was recorded on the iPad. Those are the two inputs. You click process, and then you'll have a, geo, uh, a, a geospatially aware video that can be dragged and dropped into ArcGIS Pro in both the 2D and the 3D view, so you can create a scene as well. And you'll see the drone's location, you'll see the video footprint, 
you'll have the video playing side by side, and then you'll have this crosstalk between um, these two uh, frames showing either geospatial data on the video, or you can tag things in the video that'll show up on the map. A classic example of this is um, for our utilities inspections team. So there's a flight mode we're gonna get into called perimeter scan, where it's an automated flight that flies around an object of interest. Couple that with a thermal camera, and they hit go, the drone's gonna automatically fly and collect video around the substation. And then that geospatially aware video can be pulled into ArcGIS Pro where you can click on hotspots in the video and then have those points located on the map. It's a really, really interesting capability. All right, let's talk about the flight app. So like I said, it's iPad uh, only. Um, I know the chat went wild when I said that, but that it is what it is. <laughs> um, the, the, you hit, there are two versions, like I said, the ones that are cloud connected are going to be um, uh, publishing all the fleet management and stuff to the cloud. The LE version will not, it, everything will be local on the iPad. Um, but regardless, you can plan automated mapping and manual inspection flights. It's a field data management platform. And what I mean by that is if you have multiple, I oh, apologize if you can see that, I'm double booked. Um, hold on. All right. Um, anyways, the, uh, when you're out in the field and you're capturing flight data, uh, a lot of times you're, like I said, you're doing more than one flight you are um, doing missions. And these missions might have several hundreds, if not thousands of photos. The iPad app is keeping track of which photos go to which flights. And so um, uh, it, after you're done with your collection, you can even take a, like a SD card reader for the iPad and just dump all the photos over to the iPad and the iPad will take, take care of which photos go to which flights so that, um, um, if you're using site scan, you click upload to site scan, it's going to upload all of them and process them. If you're using drone to map, you plug the iPad into your computer and all of the photos are organized into folders for each flight that happened in the field that you can use to easily organize all of your photos on your PC for processing and drone to map. Let's talk about the different flight modes. The first and most basic is area survey, most efficient way to capture a large area. This is a lawnmower pattern. The camera is uh, default pointed straight down. You can change that, but by default, it's pointed straight down. Um, this can also be used to create a quick map. A quick map is a site scan flight app tool that takes photos that are stored locally on the iPad and creates a quick stitch of them uh, on locally onto the iPad. You would use this if you have base map data that is old, or if you're in a location, a lot of times our international users who are um, you know, often like islands in the Pacific, um, they'll open up the base map and there's a cloud or something over the base map that's difficult to plan. Um, you would fly a high area survey flight and then run the quick map tool and it will stitch the photos locally on the iPad to create a base map that you can then use to plan subsequent flights. Really cool, very useful. Um, I want to dispel a rumor or a, a, a wives tale, I guess, that this um, area survey cannot produce 3D uh, content. So I guess there's a misconception that because the camera is pointed straight down, um, that it only creates 2D products. Um, that's not necessarily true. The one thing to keep in mind is that because the camera is pointed straight down, you might not have data on any vertical surfaces, you know, buildings, cliffs, things like that, that aren't necessarily visible uh, from the top down. But if you're capturing something like this, this is a great example, this is a, a dam, there's no overhangs, there's no vertical um, natural features there. This will create a, an excellent 3D um, terrain, uh, 3D uh, point cloud and 3D mesh from this data despite the camera being pointed straight down just because there's nothing um, in that area of interest that's occluded from the camera. Cross-hatch survey is what you would use if you did have any vertical features. So if you have any vertical constructed features, buildings, um, stadiums, bridges, uh, or if you have natural features like cliffs, you would want to use a crosshatch survey. So a crosshatch survey is two area surveys perpendicular to each other. And this time the camera is defaulted to a 35 degree oblique angle. So you can see this like essentially north, south, east, west flight path that is obviously doubling your flight time, but you're able to get um, 
all of the vertical facades um, from all sides within your area of interest. So you would use this if you wanted to map a, um, a, a, you know, a section of buildings, a section of neighborhood, you wouldn't necessarily need this for a single building or a single structure. We have another flight mode for that. But if you have an area of interest with multiple vertical features, you would want to use this, um, to use this feature. Um, defining occlusion. So by occlusion, I mean, if, um, if you have like a, uh, an overhang, like a constructed overhang or something that leans over that the camera can't see pointed straight down, this area would be occluded. You would want to use a crosshatch survey. So as the drone is flying here, it's capturing this oblique angle of this surface so that you can kind of see under it, see in it, um, whatever it might be. Um, so that kind of helps with that, um, that visual occlusion. Perimeter scan would be a flight mode if you have a single object. In this instance, uh, this is a, a stadium that was built, being built in LA, the new Chargers Rams Stadium. Um, it is Rams, right? Everybody's moving around these days. <laughs> Correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. I think it's Chargers Rams. I'm not sure. Um, but this this is how is would uh, you would use to collect a, a data around a single structure. And I chose this structure specifically because it's not a square. Um, there's a misconception that perimeter scan can only be done with circular or orbital patterns. Um, but this is uh, you know a very oddly shaped building. You define the footprint of the building. You define how tall that building is, and site scan will plan that perimeter scan with multiple tiers in order to capture that structure um, correctly. Um, you can define as complex a polygon as you want, and SightScan will essentially fly around it at oblique angles, capturing uh, this data. Um, I had wanted to, or I had spoken about the full motion video and how you can have um, uh, if, if, uh, video versus pictures. This is a great, great flight mode for the video mode. Um, I've seen many use cases for video mode. One of the uh, coolest one, aside from the thermal substation one I, I mentioned earlier, um, the, uh, the video mode can be used to track progress. So if you have a certain area of interest that you're tracking progress, um, you can plan these automated perimeter scan flights and the drone will fly around it collecting video. And then you can refly it every week, every day, every month. And it'll refly the same flight plan. It'll be the same three minute, 20 second video that starts and stops at the same geospatial location. And so you can take this at the end of the project, you can take this, um, take all of these video files and edit them pretty cleanly into a, a progress video. The inspection flight mode is a manual flight mode. So the drone is still using GPS barometer, accelerometers, um, but you're going to be um, holding the sticks and you're gonna be telling the camera where to point. Um, the benefit of using an inspect mode is um, all, again, if you're using the site scan cloud, all the flights and, and information is saved uh, to the cloud, um, but you would also get the benefits of turning on video mode again and having full motion video from a manual flight that you can use inside of ArcGIS Pro. Very powerful. This is also how you would use the quick map, I'm sorry, not the quick map, the quick capture, the quick capture functionality. Um, to, to kind of integrate between the two devices. You can manually fly, like I said, take pictures of trees and inspection, uh, uh, fire boundaries, all manually. And then you'll have all that data inside of Quick Capture. All right. Vertical scan is a flight mode. It's similar to perimeter scan, except you would plan a vertical scan on uh, features that you can't necessarily fly around. So here I, I have another stadium example where you're capturing the, the, this, the, these bleachers where you're not going to be flying around it. You're just going to capture the, 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 um, the area of interest that might have a, a slope or things like that. I would use this if I was in a city and I wanted to plan a flight around a building that would be um, you know, unsafe or perhaps illegal for the drone to be flying around the building all the way up, I might plan multiple vertical scans um, around that building. Uh, I would also use vertical scans if I wanted to uh, map or inspect the side of a bridge, um, maybe the side of a mine or something like that. Anything where you're having like these vertical faces that might be either pointed straight up or leaned. You can tell how, how much this object is leaning in the settings and it'll plan that flight um, up that object. 
uh, panorama flight mode. It's, it's hard to have a screenshot of this flight mode just because it's kind of so simple from a flight planning perspective, but it produces a pretty cool result. A panorama on the bottom left, you define a location and a height, and the drone will fly up to that location and take 30 or so photos that gets stitched inside of um, SightScan to, uh, to create a 360 panorama. So instead of creating a point cloud or a 3D mesh, um, it's going to create a 360 uh, pano uh, photo. Now you heard me say site scan, so the site scan cloud um, processes this into a pano. Drone to map does not have pano capabilities, but there are open source applications that run on the desktop um, that can potentially um, process these into um, 360 pano. So this flight mode is available in the LE version of the flight app um, for, for those who have that um, capability um, offline. And finally, the last flight mode is, is corridor scan. So corridor scan is a flight mode um, that you would use to capture linear corridors. So uh, anything with uh, like, you know, in this instance, it's a railroad, pipelines, roads, uh, forest roads that go up mountains, um, they're great. All of these flight modes, I kind of said it in the beginning, I'm gonna say it again, all of these flight modes have this terrain follow capability. So uh, corridor scan is probably the flight mode that benefits the most from terrain follow just because typically you have corridors that go up things or around things and you want to have that terrain follow capability so that um, not only is the drone uh, staying a legal flight uh, above the terrain, but each image is having a constant ground sampling distance or GSD over the, uh, over the surface that you're trying to map that's producing a more accurate and more consistent result once the once the data is processed. All right, um, I'm gonna. This is the last um, kind of detail slide that I have. I just kind of wanted to reiterate that we say, um, you know, site scan flight app a lot. Um, there's two apps. One is requires a subscription that's connected to the cloud and the processing. But if you're using drone to map or ortho making workflows, we have the site scan LE app that any of you can download right now from the iPad app store and log in with your ArcGIS credentials if you just wanted to use the flight, uh, flight planning aspect. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over for any questions. Actually, let me scroll through here the, the chat just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Orchards. Hey, Jeremiah, while you're doing yeah, that, go ahead, Joseph. Um, yeah. uh, just a, a, a bit of reflection that we probably don't have time in this call to turn over all the stones once again on. We've had some chats about this over the last year, but way back uh, when, when I was at USGS, we had a whole team of people that were photogrammetrists that would compute the models to create the DEMs from the orthos and so on. And so some sometimes our community has talked about, you know, how much background should students know, given the fact that drone to map and site scan are so easy, you know, be able to push, click a button, and you've got suddenly a 2D and a 3D map stitched together. It's an right. interesting discussion to, to maybe we could still have over in the SRE community because there's this bit of uh, important background that students, we would like them to know certain things that not just click, 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 and I'm not really thinking about the process. But on the other hand, do we need to drag them through all the things that we were dragged through when we learned all of this, you know, those of us that have been in the field for several uh, decades. Anyway, right. it's a, it just, I just wanted to lay that out there. It's, it's, this touches on that sort of what do you include in your courses and what you, what you don't include. There were a few questions about licensing that maybe Cancerina, my colleague, could touch on uh, since she works closely with our education community. But anyway, thanks, Jeremiah. I just wanted to say that. This is wonderful. Yeah, you know, and maybe I'll, I'll kind of chime in there. Um, I do get asked this question quite a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm relatively new to the education community. Um, let me just put that. Maybe I should have introduced that in the very beginning. Usually I'm talking to, um, you know, construction firms, utilities firms when, when I'm talking about this. So I, I'm new to education. But this is a very common um, topic amongst the industries, um, particularly with surveyors and photogrammetrists, like you said, because these are people that are, are not only well educated on the kind of the background of how these are created, but in a lot of times they're, they're um, legally tied to how accurate something is and how, you know, and they're like, well, you know, this needs to be done a certain way. If, if I'm going to be stamping this or signing this, you know, how do I, um, how do we ensure that it's, that people are going through the correct processes? And, um, you know, the reality is, is that with every new um, 
you know, technology change, you're going to have this sort of conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I went through, so uh, early on in my career, I wanted to be a LIDAR pilot, uh, an airplane pilot. So I went through uh, at Texas A&M, I went through my, my spatial sciences, my remote sensing courses, but at the same time, I was going through flight school. And when I was going through flight school, one of the biggest things was that they were taking away a certain type of um, navigation from the testing. So the FAA said, okay, we're not going to have um, pilots, they're not going to be required to show that they can follow an NDB approach or an NDB approach into an airport and navigation. And this threw a lot of the old timers to, to a loop. They're like, well, no, that like NDBs, this is like the backbone, backbone of aviation navigation. What do you mean you're not going to require students to learn this? And the reality was, is that we had GPS that was, um, you know, had been in the aviation community for decades and was proven. And they're just like, you're going to have to have um, a little bit of flexibility as things come in. In the education space, I think it's very important to understand where this, how this data is being created. I think that there's this really good blend between traditional mm-hmm. photogrammetry, which I had to learn in school, and then the new fangled structure for motion stuff. Because um, more often than not, you're going to have, especially early on, you're going to have data products that look bad or the, it is not stitching well because of certain things, right? Certain factors. And having that knowledge of how um, imagery is collected and processed will help you solve that problem. Um, knowing gimbal angles, knowing flying heights and how it relates to ground sample distance and key points. These are all very important and I don't think should be removed from education just because our software has an easy button. Um, that's my politically correct answer, but I think it holds true. <laughs> yeah, it's well, it's well said. It's good things to chew on. Many thanks, Jeremiah. Hey, Jeremiah, yeah. I think we have a few questions on here on the pricing. I don't know if you have the slide on that, but I remember that if, even though this is not, these two products are not included uh, into the enterprise agreement, but recently there's very, very desirable pricing for education, right? Um, mm. Can you talk yeah. a little bit on that, please? I can, I can talk a little bit. I'll be completely honest. When I searched our internal site for these um, pricing decks, I didn't find them. And so I didn't know if this is something that we talk about in other sorts of conversations. Um, so I didn't find those, those decks, but I do know a little bit about the pricing. Um, Ken Serena, I think you know a little bit more about drone to map pricing um, mm-hmm. than I do, especially because of, I believe it's either has changed or will change. Um, but both products have educational um, pricing. The size skin one is a little bit more difficult to explain. Like I said, it's a SaaS solution. It's not it's not necessarily um, named users that you install on machines. So it, it doesn't relate to machines or it doesn't relate to s- number of students. Um, but SiteScan is sold in two ways. Um, the first is, okay, how many operators do you want? How many access licenses do you want? There's the price per uh, license. When we sell SiteScan to educators, we sell it a little bit differently because as you guys know, you have students that come in and go each semester you're not going to buy operator licenses per student. It doesn't really make sense that way. So there is site scan education pricing for a different type of way we sell it, which is number of photos uploaded for processing per year, right? And there are different tiers, however many, you know, whatever your um, program has, whatever your coursework has in it, you can kind of estimate how many photos are gonna be uploaded and processed by how many students. Um, there are different tiers that start at, you know, 25,000 photos a year and go up to a million mm. photos per year. Mm. And these are deeply, deeply discounted and they include unlimited users. So uh, it's up to the um, educator to add or remove licenses as they wish. Yeah. Um, and that, that works really well with um, the education style where you have students coming in, you're just going to add them to the SiteScan org and they can upload and process, um, process photos. Yes, yes, that's that's really good. Also, the same thing with the drone to map. We have like, you know, how number of license, different number of the license or user that you like. And I got I got the information from Angela Lee here. Um, if you interested in either a drone to map or site scan, please contact your account manager uh, from uh, Esri, or you can also give to academic cells at s3.com and we will make sure that we answer all of them and also work with you if you want to implement that so we can make sure that you will be successful on that okay 
-hmm. So, all right. I'm going to put it in here, the email as well. Uh, there is one question on that, uh, Jeremiah, if you want to address that. Yeah. I, I see, yeah, I see a couple that I wanted to kind of touch. Um, the one was from Andy about structure for motion processing engines. Um, that's something I didn't um, cover. I didn't really want to get into the weeds, but let me talk about it really briefly. So um, drone to map has been um, traditionally based on uh, the PIX4D processing engine. So Esri Partner um, has this PIX4D processing engine. And so whenever you process the data, that's kind of the engine behind the scenes inside of drone to map that produces the data products. Um, for those of you who have been testing know that um, there is a drone to map beta um, that is around and it's going to be released, I believe at the end of the year, that essentially swaps out the PIX4D engine with a Esri developed um, processing engine. And so, uh, this new version of drone to map will be an Esri developed uh, structure from motion engine. Uh, but today, if you're not using beta today, it's using uh, Pix4D. Site scan, it gets a little bit more complicated because site scans in the cloud, you actually use multiple processing engines, depending on what you need and depending on what you want. We have different processing engines that are there. Some of them is automatic that you can't see and some of them you get to select. Um, so site scan, it's, it's very based. The, the initial processing step is Pix4D. So we have a Pix4D in the cloud um, that takes your photos and does that initial processing step and produces the orthomosaics and the point clouds um, for that. The meshing engine is a little bit different. So inside of the mesh, you can produce a mesh by our shore engine. So, um, so the, some of you might be aware that uh, we acquired a team out in Stuttgart, Germany that has a an engine called InFrames. And InFrames is a, a really high resolution uh, meshing engine that's uh, probably something simpler, similar to context capture if you used context capture. And this was traditionally a desktop based application that took photos and initial processing from Pix4D and created a 3D mesh. Well, uh, at the UC this year, we released Shure inside of SiteScan. So now you have that meshing capability that's there essentially automatically. You just select it from the meshing engine dropdown box and you'll have that sure, uh, sure mesh. Um, I believe in the, um, yes, the reality capture and, and site scan for ArcGIS plenary video in the links that Ken Serena um, sent out. And that link, we show some of that sure mesh. Um, I believe it was Telluride where we, you know, we showed the, the capabilities of that sure mesh with some pretty complex and, and, and large terrain. So we're excited about that. The other processing engine that has been in um, site scan cloud for a while is the Autodesk engine. So the Autodesk, Autodesk recap engine is a meshing engine that's there for our folks who use uh, primarily Autodesk workflows. So that mesh can be exported directly into um, things like um, InfraWorks, uh, Civil 3D, Navisworks, because it's a native Autodesk file format. So if that's your workflow, SiteScan does have a meshing engine for that. Okay. Jeremiah, I think that's a good question here from Peter. So is there any plan to make drone to map end-to-end -end solution for offline for the field use? Or perhaps by adding the flight planning and checklist capability to drone to map? Mm -hmm. Or do you think it's a combination that you say, like, use the, I don't know, what's the answer? Yeah, um, the answer is yes. Um, the product teams are talking about that and talking about what that is going to look like. Um, because as you guys probably noticed, the naming is just a little bit confusing when we're talking about the site scan flight app and the site scan cloud. The site scan flight app can be used to drone, with drone to map. Understood, uh, where there is a plan to simplify that workflow and have um, an app that might be called something like ArcGIS Flight or something like that, who knows. Um, but this app will be a standalone app that has a little bit more um, direct and more simple integration with an offline workflow like drone to map or an online workflow uh, like site scan. So keep your ears out. Um, I haven't heard anything official, um, but that's those are kind of the conversations that we're having internally is simplifying that. So at the moment, maybe using the site scan light, download it as that's a right. desktop and work with the drone to map, right? And then that's exactly right. Awesome. There is two questions here uh, related to, do you use drone to map only integrated with ArcGIS Pro? Or also you can use it with, I guess the other one is ArcGIS Desktop, you know, ArcMap. Uh, I see. So um, ArcGIS Pro and drone to map are both built on similar 
application development frameworks. So that's why the integration is, is done so well. So even there's a button inside of Drone to Map that says open in pro, pro open, and it opens up all the layers and everything. Arc Map is a little bit differently, is built a little bit differently. Um, one of the main reason, or one of the main things is that Arc Map um, doesn't support the 3D scenes and things like ArcGIS Pro um, supports and that Drone to Map generates. The data products processed from Drone to Map can be used inside of Arc Map, but those data products are going to be mainly the DSMs, the DC, DTMs, the ortho mosaics that have to be brought in um, from the add data button. Um, point clouds uh, can be brought in if you created a last data set um, and things like that, but it's not going to be necessarily as automatic. I see. Okay, there is one question in here regarding the application. Would cross hatch work well for mapping an orchard? I know that 3D is difficult to capture a visualized forest. Yeah. Um, I've captured a lot of uh, types of agriculture and crosshatch tends to work better because on one hand, you might have monocultures or homogeneous um, features where if you have a standard area survey, a lot of times each image is going to look exactly the same. Each, each it's rows of corn or rows of wheat are gonna look exactly the same. And sometimes that's hard to stitch. And so if, if you encounter something like that, I do suggest a crosshatch because not only are you getting um, more photos over an area, each photo is, is oblique a little bit and they're going to look a little bit differently. Um, the same would apply to orchards, to vineyards. Um, you know, anytime you're having like an agriculture, it's, a, it's relatively homogeneous. Sometimes that crosshatch flight um, mode can, um, can create a better data set. Now, if you're asking specifically about orchards to see if you can take oblique photos that can look underneath the branches, it really depends on the trees. Um, you know, cherry trees are a little bit lower, some trees are a little bit higher. It really depends on, um, on the actual um, vegetation. Um, but I think, yes, in general, I would, I would prefer a crosshatch. The, the, the challenge is going to be that crosshatch obviously adds um, double the flight time. And sometimes for agriculture, that, that could be a while to fly. Awesome. Joseph, is there any questions that I missed that we still have a couple of minutes here? Not that I can see that we haven't or you or, or Jeremiah hasn't touched on, but uh, I wanted to make sure that people knew about the next chat, which will be on 5 October, topic TBD. We can put the, that link in there as well. Yes, and I think that I'm gonna double check with Jeremiah. It seems like the, the one of the resource that is in the SharePoint, it's not accessible yet for public. We're going to work on that. And then we're going to publish all these resources, including the recording as well in the, as usual, the education chat um, hub site for this. And there's a lot of questions um, for this uh, drone to met and site scan. So we probably considering also, I can work with Jeremiah to write a, a FAQ for the education community on some, based on some of these questions. Okay. Um, so if, if you have any questions still, feel free to contact us. You know us all here. And also if you want to know the pricing uh, and everything. So hopefully um, this is a, it's a great information uh, that's useful for everybody. But we would like to really say thank you to Jeremiah for, for an awesome mm -hmm. presentation. It was. I learned a lot. And I trust that everybody did as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was great to chat to everybody. Have a good one.